welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. You will not be surprised if you've read the title of this episode to learn that Charlie is with me today. Hello, Charlie. Oh, hi. How are you doing? (laughs) <laughs> it's like as if you coincidentally oh do you happen to be talking about the 17th century oh I just happen to be on zoom right now yeah I'm <laughs> always around for this kind of thing you you mentioned the 17th century Alex and I appear like a specter but um I've got a fantastic guest for you so I think you I think you'll be pleased today we've got Jane Hayter Hames with us she is a historian and her previous works include Arthur O'Connor United Irishman and the fall of Charles the first she's here today to talk about her new book Puritan rule under Cromwell hi Jane hi good to be here oh we're so happy to have you back and thank you for dragging us all back to the 17th century it's uh, tough going. <laughs> we're very very happy to be here so let's kick off let's start the book is started with the martyrdom sorry the execution of king charles the first um so at that point the country is moving towards a new form of government what on earth were were the the puritan rulers going to do at this time Well, they had a challenge. They, as it were, flung themselves forward by executing the king before really thinking through how they were going to run the country. And with the king went all the institutions of the king, the Privy Council, his special courts. And then almost immediately, the Commons abolished the House of Lords, which meant that the country was being run by a single chamber parliament. And it was going to be quite a challenge to make that work, although I think they didn't really understand at the beginning just how tricky it was going to be. So they created a council of state, which was going to be the sort of executive branch government, but they kept rotating the members of it and the president of it. So they didn't really have a stable stable structure at the top of the government. They've got to get full control of England and her dependencies, which meant Ireland, the Channel Islands, the American colonies. They got to provide for their own security because they had many enemies, both within the country and without. All the defeated royalists, the levellers were still agitating for more rights. And of course, all the foreign heads of state, most of whom were monarchs, were very unlikely to accept them as the rulers of the country. And in Ireland, and to some extent in Scotland, there was the remnants of a royal government with armies at their disposal. So security was a really big issue. And then they had all the expectations of their supporters, religious expectations, expectations of reform, changes wanted in religion. And then they had all the merchant classes looking for an improvement in trade after a decade of war. So they had quite a lot to grapple with. It's it's huge, isn't it? Because you know that idea of <laughs> I, I always compare it. It's it's Brexit, isn't it? We don't want a king anymore. Um, we're going to get rid of him and chop off his head. But no idea of how how you function without that head of state. So it's it's complete back to the drawing board, isn't it? For for um for the the parliamentarians. Yes, although there'd been a lot of discussion towards the latter end of the 1640s, the the agitators under the influence of the levellers had put forward a programme for government, a programme for a new constitution. And in all the negotiations with the king, there had been ways of adapting the monarchical government. But actually, because they were so swift in their desire to kill the king, I think scared that something else was going to blow up in their faces and actually out for retribution to some extent so they made the act before they'd really set up the thing that was going to follow 
They did. I do, do you know what, though? We have to talk about if there's an empty throne, I guarantee you someone is going to want to sit on it. So who do we <laughs> Charlie's got her hand raised. Who do we have at this point that is is a claimant to the throne? Well, the real the real claimant to the throne is the eldest son of Charles the first. Mm-hmm. Charles, Prince of Wales, now proclaimed king in both Dublin and Edinburgh as Charles the second. And um, he was actually in The Hague when his father was executed, where his sister, Princess Mary, lived with her husband, Prince William of Orange. Um, he had a younger brother, James Duke of York, who was actually in France when his father was killed. And then there were two younger children still held hostage in England, Henry Duke of Gloucester, who actually at one point was put forward as a potential king, uh, Princess Elizabeth, the girls were obviously not really in the top of the line for the throne. <laughs> and then there was the youngest princess, Henriette, who was with her mother in the in Paris. Um, and then there was also Elizabeth, the exiled queen of Bohemia was in The Hague, and uh, she was Charles's aunt, but she didn't have a direct line of claim to the throne, but she was very, very popular with English Protestants, and she had several very vigorous sons. So there were plenty of royal stewards waiting in the wings. Amazing. Um, I I love this sort of idea of, at one point, them sort of mooting the idea of perhaps putting Henry, Duke of Gloucester, in the in the line of you know in the line of succession, so that he could be a bit of a a figurehead monarch, and perhaps being a bit younger, they could mould him a little bit more, and he might be more willing to toe the line. Yeah, and it's quite touching that when Charles I saw the children that were still in England just before he was executed, he was allowed to see Elizabeth and Henry. He actually warned Henry that that's what would happen mm-hmm. if the parliamentarians or the you know real revolutionaries couldn't get their hands on Charles and James, but they wanted a puppet king. He would be the one that was chosen. And Henry promised his father, no, no, I will never do that. It was really dark, wasn't it? I sort of imagine this conversation where he sort of sits his son on his knee and says, they will cut off thy father's head and they might try and make you king. It's sort of this very bizarre recollection that, that gets passed down. Yeah, it's it's very extreme if you're a king. Uh, it's not just a little bit of problem in the family. It's life and death real power it really is so it's not just it's not just england obviously we we forget this so much when we talk about uh, the idea of an english civil war there's a lot going on there's scotland who are incredibly upset that we've killed another Stuart king without telling them um and lots of problems in ireland which draw oliver cromwell over to ireland um let's have a chat about that what what's he doing there what what's going on What's the problem in Ireland? Um, the problem in Ireland obviously goes back a really long way because it's been a dependency of England since the 12th century. And it's often reminded that it's a sub- subordinate kingdom, even though it is actually a kingdom. Mm. Um, but in 1641, there'd been a rebellion in Ireland, largely provoked by the plantations in Ulster. And um, money had been ro- raised by loan. And the idea was that that money would be used to reconquer Ireland. And when the conquest was over, the people, the adventurers who put forward the funds would be paid in Irish land, confiscated Irish. It was going to be more plantation. But because the war then broke out in England, the war in Ireland was only sporadically pursued. And when Charles I was executed, there was every fear One, that as a Catholic country, it might rebel again, it might ally itself with Catholic powers in Europe. And in any case, case, it was a really valuable dependency which had got to be got back under the control of London. But uh, the Duke of Ormond was there with a viable royalist army and the Catholic Confederacy still had an army of their own and held a large part of the country. So in terms of security and in terms of the territorial wealth of England, it was absolutely vital to get control of Ireland again. But many English armies have been to Ireland and they had very often failed, there'd been illness, careers had collapsed. 
So when they asked Oliver Cromwell to go, he was a little bit ambivalent about it. Was he going to have enough men? Would he be given enough money? But they reassured him and he managed to collect both a lot of men and a lot of money, took the command and went down to Wales. And all the army was shipped across with Oliver Cromwell, who was violently sick on the way. He'd never, I don't think, travelled overseas before or since. <laughs> um, and when he got to Ireland, I mean, this was a country against which he had really profound prejudices. He thought that, you know, they had all rebelled, that they were all carrying blood guilt for what had been actually a pretty awful rebellion. And it was really vital to his career and to the future of England that it was a success. So it was a very highly charged expedition. Mm. And um, the parliamentarians held Dublin Castle. So that was a really good start. And he went there and prepared. And then his first expedition out of Dublin was up to Drogheda, the port town just to the north of there. Yeah. And um, his reputation kind of sank in Drogheda because unlike Cromwell tended to be for all that he was a very, very effective general. He was actually quite a merciful man. And by and large, you know, there was not slaughter. He was against um, hanging corporal punishment. But in Drogheda, it was the complete opposite. Some of his officers offered um, surrender terms, but they were not fulfilled. All the people in one of the castles in the, in the town were put to the sword. The people in the other major fortification, they were surrounded by um, timber and furniture, which was set on fire and they were flushed out or burned. And the slaughter went on for three days afterwards. It said that every priest that was anywhere near the place was killed and a lot of civilians. So it was um, very unlike him, but of course it left a great stain on his memory in Ireland and a not dissimilar thing happened in Wexford, but he did his job. As soon as the fighting season started, early in the following year, out went his men on campaign. They take all their artillery up to the walls of the fortified towns, yeah. blast holes in the walls, in they go, take the town. And only one really major town held out for a while against him in Clonmel, but he managed to take, well, he and his officers managed to take towns of the eastern seaboard, working their way inland, working their way up the river valleys in a sort of systematic reconquest of the country. Yeah. But um, he was recalled because there was a greater challenge in the hands of government. We have to as well. It's not only Ireland that he sent to, it's Scotland as well, isn't it? We have to look at Scotland and how Yeah, that he was he was story. hurried. He was really mm. hurried to come back because the Scottish problem was getting quite acute because the 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 Scottish government, which was really led by the leaders of the Kirk, the church, didn't acknowledge the new government in London and had proclaimed Charles II as King of Scotland. And the London government, which had thought that they could befriend the Scots because they were fellow Protestants, actually saw that they were Presbyterian, they didn't like the kind of religious um, disposition that was going on down in England, and they did not accept um, the death of Charles I and the deposition of his son. So London actually didn't think it was just going to defend Northern England. It saw that it was very likely to have to invade Scotland again. Yeah. And um, there was a real problem about who was going to lead the army and how that was going to be achieved. So there were these messages going to Ireland, to Cromwell, you've got to get back, you've got to get back, you've got to get back. And they got him back. And he was lionised, you know, he'd done this fantastic job for them in Ireland and they wanted him to go off on the Scottish expedition. And his commander, I mean, the actual overall commander of the army was still General Fairfax, but Fairfax refused to go. He said, we don't have any right to invade Scotland. We made a deal with the Scots and we just don't have any sort of footing for going in there. I don't want to go. It was said that his wife, who was a Presbyterian, had influenced him, but whatever that is, uh, he wasn't going to go, and Cromwell took up the command and set off north, which is an incredible thing to think about, you know, because he was in his 50s by now, and he'd just gone through a punishing campaign in Ireland, which everybody knew was tough territory, and now he set off for Scotland. And yeah. Scotland also had a viable army, so it wasn't going to be just a walkover. No, but he has one of his 
one of his sort of crowning glories in Scotland, doesn't he, at the Battle of Dunbar? Yeah, he was very, very proud of the Battle of Dunbar. And um, I don't know how, to what extent it was planned, but he had two major victories, both on the same day. And actually, he managed to die on the 3rd of September as well. So um, it was it was actually an extraordinary victory because David Leslie, the commander of the Scottish army, was a very experienced seasoned campaigner and he got into a very good position and the English army was kind of on this neck of land. It couldn't get, it couldn't attack Leslie, which was who were his troops were on the higher ground and it couldn't get down the road to the south, which led to England. So they were in a very, very awkward position. And the only way they could do it, which is probably a strategy devised by Lambert, was to attack very early when the Scots weren't ready. But they had to attack all the way along the English front line and just beat them back with diversions. And actually, they achieved their aim within a matter of hours. And it was, you know, the Scottish army was absolutely decimated by that victory. But by then, Charles yes. was in Scotland. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and um, a royal steward at the head of the Scots army really helped, you know, morale. Well, it did, and then it didn't, because the, the Scots do something very interesting, don't they, when they realise that um, that they've got a lot of men who are fighting out of loyalty to the king, when really they should be fighting for God. There's always a problem when the Kirk leaders have got the upper hand because that's the first issue for them, that everybody in the army and the cause itself should be a very pure covenanting Presbyterianism. And it's really those splits among the Scots that were their downfall. And, um, yeah, the, I mean, there were attempts to attack the English army as a separate entity. But finally, I mean, they Charles and, and the sort of Scottish gentry got at the head of the army. The Kirk leaders were kind of demoralized. I think their, their moment was slight, slightly over by then. And um, But Charles and the leaders of the Scottish army were no match for Cromwell. He was a better strategist. He had a bigger, tougher army and he managed to corner them really. They Lambert led troops into Fife. They flushed Charles out of Perth. And really, then their only way was south. And Rommel and his troops really chased Charles and the Scots back into England. And they hoped so that Charles they would get sorry. They hoped that they would pick up a lot of um, men and recruits in England, but the the English were just exhausted by war. They just weren't going, and especially since Northern England had been invaded by the Scots repeatedly, they just thought, oh no, another Scottish army, no. So Cromwell and his men by then was a large force. I mean, he mobilized everyone he could get because this was the big battle for him. If he could beat Charles now in England and really beat him, he would stay beaten. That you know, it would be very difficult for him to remobilize. So Cromwell got put everything he had into it, chased them down to Worcester, and there was the most enormous battle. I mean, it went on all day. It was a real slaughter. They say that at the end of it, the whole town just stank of dead men and horses. Um, and Cromwell won, and Charles escaped, and Charles was on the run for weeks. What do you think would have happened if he'd been caught? I think that's a really interesting thing to worry about because were they going to execute another king? I mean, were they going to just hold him in prison for the rest of his life where he's going to be a figurehead for resistance? I mean, did it actually suit the parliamentarians to let all that he escaped? They certainly went to a lot of trouble to try and capture him and he certainly feared for his life. But I don't think capturing him would have been very easy for them to solve. I think that would have caused them a whole new problem, just like the one they'd had before. I think if so, they'd have caught up with him, it might have been the best move tactically for him to meet with an accident in being captured. 
resisting arrest, say. Uh, yes, I think that could be it. Yeah. In the nice, nice, easy. Oh, whoops, we found him. Here he is. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, that I think so it, they didn't want another king in prison and another great big show trial. And uh, no, they didn't want that. No. But at the same time, he has invaded with a foreign army. He has invaded with a foreign army. Really, really dodgy. So following the Battle of Worcester, which it, you're completely right, was such a horrific fight and so pivotal to everything that this country became and, and our history. And people need to know more about the Battle of Worcester. We need to talk about it more. That's my TED talk. Thanks for coming. Um, so after the battle, it seems that the Commonwealth is is kind of starting to come up onto some stable ground now. Um, how do they set out their stall for the future? What's what's the future of this Commonwealth going to look like at this point? Um, well, there's going to be a union. Um, the three kingdoms are going to be governed from London by a single parliament. And they make that very clear. Uh, they do some supposedly negotiations with the Scots about that, but actually the Scots are kind of getting told what's going to happen. Mm. Um, that's going to mean free trade between Scotland and England, at least. There was talk about there being free trade with Ireland, but that was never actually on the agenda. Um, but now they've got to get on with... Um, fulfilling all the expectations of all the people who had supported or were ambivalent about the revolution. Because, okay, they're a lot more secure in that they govern all their own territory. They're probably more secure without, to some extent, but they still have got to get the support of the country. They've got to get enough of the public behind them that it's not a real threat the whole time. So they've got to, you know, get on with reform of the law, Tithes of behaviour. They're trying to create a godly society with all that that's going to entail. They've got to get people interested in their sort of religious propaganda, their religious aspiration. Um, there's actually a lot of expectation among the less well off, and, and, and you know, the population of these countries is essentially rural, and all those people would like to see changes in tenancies, land use, the terms on which they're using their land, which is probably not going to be forthcoming because although there's been a revolution, the people in charge are still essentially landowners, lawyers, the elite. Um, they need to reform the whole way in which debt and debtors' prisons were managed. It was, I mean, it seems like a smallish issue to us, but actually it was a very big issue to them because if you got thrown in a debtor's prison, you couldn't get back out. And chancery, which was the sort of legal side of all those kind of um, debt issues, they wanted reform. So these are reforms that really matter to people, but are gonna be pretty difficult to do anything about. They're even They're more rendered difficult, aren't they, by money or a complete lack of, given that wars and revolutions are very, very expensive. They were really in debt. And mm. um, actually, the figures for the government are really difficult. I mean, when you look at what Charles I's income and expenditure was, it's absolutely ballooned because of the cost of the army. And they're very keen to build up the navy. And that, again, is going to take a lot of money. And all during the war, they were um, taxing people. The assessment tax was a new tax. And they then brought in excise. And they can't afford to let go of those taxes. So the tax burden on the whole country, and now in Ireland and Scotland, those taxes are being levied too, is very, very high and very unlike what was known before the war. So they're really keen to get down the costs of government. But to get down the costs of government, they have to let go a lot of their soldiers. And if they let go of a lot of the army, will they actually be able to hold on to the three kingdoms it's not at all clear that they would they've garrisoned ireland they've garrisoned scotland they know that there's a several certain level of unrest in england and anyway to get rid of the soldiers they've got to pay them everything they owe them and they haven't really got the money <laughs> so 
that is a and it's a problem actually that runs all the way through to the end of the decade all the way through the rule under Cromwell is a money problem but they have things to sell yes um, <laughs> <laughs> they've got a load of a load of uh art and gold haven't they oh that beautiful picture collection I don't know if anybody's seen that big exhibition they put on of Charles the First picture collection. Wasn't it wonderful? It was absolutely fantastic. And you suddenly realise what they sold and what they let go and how little of it we ever got back. I know. Because it was all of one period and it was absolutely top quality. I mean, Charles the First had many weaknesses, but he was a real connoisseur of art. He had a real eye for pictures and they sold all of that. I love they the sell- story about them selling it, you know, based on the size. So it'd be like a like a, a <laughs> tiny sort of a tiny little painting that was maybe done by Leonardo da Vinci or something like that. And they'd be like, it's a small painting. Oh, for a shilling. It's like some amateur getting hold of our book collections and sticking them on eBay, isn't it? And just like five for a pound. Oh, it was tragic, actually. I mean, it wasn't really the there were, I mean, there was a lot of other wealth in land and they they yeah. let all of that go as well. And I mean, they didn't really get much value for it because all they were doing was paying off debts. And, and I mean, some of those lands were already promised away. So it's not like it actually brought them cash that they could spend, but it did get some of the debt off the government books. But all the church land, the bishops, the dean and chapters, all the crown lands belonging to the king himself and to Henrietta Maria and lands which had been, you know, held for the princes, all sold. And when they got, you know, after that, then they started selling royalist lands because up until then the lands had just been held and they had to pay tax on it. Royalists had to pay tax to get the the use of their land back. But now the government's starting to sell those as well. But it didn't, I mean, it did get a lot of the debt paid down but it didn't quite solve the problem because of course it's not just the debts it's the fact that you've you then got to run the country like you say you want to invest you want the navy you want to be able to expand and and grow so so you melt down the crown (laughs) yeah and they had ambitions for government because you know they wanted to improve religious education and they wanted better court systems and greater justice I think they thought that they could win people over if they gave them justice education and modernize things but all of that cost money they just didn't have it so let's talk about something else that they melted down um why did Cromwell dissolve parliament it's a very big question I don't think he ever really quite came to terms with himself over that and I think the sort of one word answer is impatience. Mm. They'd expected so much from the new government, Commonwealth government, eradicating the king and all the sort of repressive features of the monarchy. But actually most of the things that the Puritan army itself and its supporters really wanted was being progressed very, very slowly. They wanted reform. It was very small and slight. It was not really being got on with and um the the army was which was probably the most puritan part of the country should we say um i mean that was not just they didn't just want a reform of people's behavior some of them were real millenarians they thought that you know overcoming this ungodly king and the enormous changes that were coming was actually a prelude to a real change that coming of the kingdom of Jesus. You know, the fifth monarchists thought it was absolutely imminent. It was coming tomorrow morning, but they had to have a full godly revolution to bring it on. And it was their victory and it was being squandered by this actually sort of civilian, not very godly parliament. And I think also a misunderstanding of how parliamentary systems work, because they're really slow. You put things into legislation and debate them and this and that and the other thing. You know, they wanted swift decisions, just like an army commander, done tomorrow morning, yeah. and it's all over. But the whole thing began to focus on having elections and getting a new parliament, because people had been banned from parliament, people had died, there were seats that hadn't been filled, and also it had been sitting for a long time. It was the long parliament. 
And the idea that it was now the only institution that could run the country and it had been there in a rather decaying for condition for so long, we must have a new representative, we must hold elections. And there was a lot of delay about holding those elections. And meanwhile, Ireland hadn't been settled and the soldiers over there hadn't been paid. But when it actually came to, but what will elections bring us? You know, how are we going to manage the elections? We might get a chamber full of royalists, Presbyterians, all the people that we most despise, when actually what we want is godly revolution and, you know, the coming of a better world. They and, were very uh, despised, weren't they? They weren't, Parliament wasn't a popular thing at this time. It had been, like you say, it had been sitting for a really long time. Everyone's saying, when are you going to call an election? When are you going to call an election? And they were actually known as the rump, weren't they? They were the rump Parliament, Parliament because they'd been purged before the death of the king. They'd actually been purged by the army. So a lot of people had been removed from the Parliament on a permanent basis. And then since then, some of them had refused to sit. And there's just wear and tear in parliaments. You know, people die. They aren't really active anymore. So they definitely needed some new blood. But the army began to suspect that the parliament weren't going to hold proper elections, that they were just going to hold recruiter elections and fill a few seats. Actually, there were so many seats needed filling that that probably would have created a very different body. But... Um, and finally, there was a sort of crisis meeting at Cromwell's house where somebody ran in and said they're passing the bill for the elections and it's not the one you want. And it, actually, the, all the sort of godly part of the army was putting so much pressure on Cromwell that I think he may have been pushed into acting. But, I mean, he didn't even sort of put on his better clothes. He just rushed over there and gave them a great tongue lashing, which he was much given to called in the troopers and closed the parliament and um, and closed down the, the Council of State, which was the executive arm of the parliament. So then there was nobody left to run the country and there was great disquiet. So how do you run the country in that situation? Well, for a few months, Cromwell and his, basically his army officers ran it. I mean, they... Yeah created a council, but three quarters of the council were army officers and Cromwell was at the head of it. So really, it was ruled by the army. At least that's certainly how the country saw it. And um, and some key decisions were taken during that time, not least of all the transplantation to Connaught in Ireland, where they decided not to just award land where it was, but to actually move the Irish population and try and get them all into one place. And then immediately after that, they called a parliament of the godly. I mean, they did research of all the radical sects and the independent congregations, and they nominated members to come up and become a, a new parliament. And um, it was slightly unlike Cromwell, because although he had some sort of millenarian kind of um, notions, he was basically a very practical um, man with lots of common sense and he lay, later looked back on that as a story of his own weakness and folly but I think he had to try and fulfill the hopes of his very Puritan army and the Parliament of Saints um, assembled that autumn and actually did a lot of business they were very active very busy and passed quite a lot of legislation including the legislation for Ireland but they were so linked to the radical sects and those very wild churches. I mean, Blackfriars and All Hallows in London, they were just, you know, really giving everybody that was of a Puritan bent a bad name. And, you know, foreign ambassadors and, and uh, visitors from overseas were horrified by what was going on because they just sounded like really ranting and actually quite bloodthirsty. There was a lot of... Yeah like bloodthirsty talk coming out of those churches. And then they start, the Parliament started to slightly threaten property interests. And I think that at that point, they're days in. <laughs> so it's one thing to sort of be ruled by religious extremists. We're kind of fine with that up to a point until you start taking my stuff away. And then, then we don't like it anymore. <laughs> That's usually the end of the line. <laughs> None of these parliaments actually 
aim to overturn the social order. The system of ranks, the system of landholding was never really under serious consideration. Lots of other reform was expected, but not really that. And especially not by Cromwell himself, who was a sort of minor gentleman with a land, a little bit of land and, and those sort of friends and relations. And they didn't expect all of that to be upset. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we talk to people like um, like Miranda Malins, who's spent a lot of time with Oliver Cromwell. Um, and the idea of him actually being quite a, a conservative type guy, he's not. He's not a leveller. He's not trying to you know, this this idea of of revolution, you know, in, in inverted commas, it it isn't that in its sort of tradition, in its classic sense of the word, is it? He he's not trying to rip up the rule book uh, completely. It's not the French Revolution, and some people say it was actually a conservative revolution that 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 the people who really pushed it forward. Um, thought that Charles I was overturning the accepted way of doing government in England and were trying to reinstate it. And yeah, it no, it's not, you know, back to a blank sheet of paper and start again at all. No, they want to keep, they really cherish English law, which they want to support because all parts of the law and constitution that they want to keep going. And they certainly don't want to upset the the natural social order that they've got. No, not really. I mean, it's meritocratic. I think more people with skills, maybe further down the social system, are getting promoted. But then it's always surprising to see who used to get promoted under the monarchical system. So I'm not sure how I could compare that, really. So in terms of him being a being a bit of a bit of a conservative, I think you when 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 we sort of get the highlights and the the broad brushstrokes of the the civil war and what comes after it, I think people think you know it's it's Charles versus Cromwell. Charles has his head cut off, and Cromwell makes himself king. It's clear that that's not what happens. There's an awful lot that's happening um, under under this at this time under Cromwell. So how is it that we go from the Parliament of Saints and and all of these sort of experimentations? to to a protectorate, to Cromwell becoming top dog? Well, I think you can look at the whole decade as an experiment. So they've had an experiment of just a, a, a single chamber parliament in the country. They've had a short experience of rule by the army, but that was not really supposed to happen. The parliament of the saints became threatening. So... All that discussion that had gone on before Charles I was executed about how to improve the constitution was now tried, they tried to put it into effect and they wrote the instrument of government. I think Lambert was probably the main author of the instrument of government to try and produce a balance of powers in the constitution. And they saw that they were going to have to have a fairly active chief executive that, you know, rotating the council and the president of the council was just chaotic when people came from overseas to do business with the government they didn't know who to talk to so they went back to the idea of a single person in charge and a council and a parliament and then try to balance those powers so that nobody you know has the upper hand or too much of the upper hand and the instrument of government you know drew on a lot of the work that had been done before um and in many ways, it was, you know, quite a, a, a step forward. But the trouble was that a lot of people just did not accept that the army could write the constitution. And one parliament had been purged before Charles I was executed. And another one, which was a perfectly valid one, had been closed down. And another one instigated, which had closed down too. So... The trust is being broken all the way down the road. So when you get up a constitution, even if it's not too bad, yeah. um, you've got to really make it work. There's a lot of distrust all around. Um, the protectorate, it worked up to a point. In, they're starting to have a lot of legal problems because laws have been passed by all these various forms of government and the courts are starting to say, well, I don't know if that law is actually still valid or whether that was passed by a valid parliament. 
So in a way, to get a stable system with Oliver P at the top of it, signing off on all the orders, was at least helping that. But there was still a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, and under the instrument of government, Cromwell had to call a parliament every two years. And as soon as he calls a, called a parliament, back came all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> Because the parliament challenged him and challenged the instrument of government and said it was not for the army to write the constitution. They were going to write the constitution. So the problem was not solved. And no, I think it absolutely the... wasn't, was it? Because then the protectorate implodes. Um, the protectorate did survive Cromwell. Yeah. I mean, it was still active, although being revised at the time mm. of his death. They, there was a major revision under a document called the Humble Petition and Advice. Um, and under that, Cromwell was to choose his successor, whereas under the instrument of government, the council was supposed to choose the successor. But everybody was getting in a real panic because you could see that Cromwell was aging. You know, he yeah. had a long career in the army. He'd had a nasty accident on a horse. His handwriting was becoming quite shaky. He was getting ill more often. He was in his late 50s. Everybody thought he's going to be gone soon. And then what's going to happen? Things are not stable. We don't know where we stand. A lot of land settlement issues have not actually been properly legislated for. People had a great deal to lose. And um, so they pressed Cromwell to become king because they thought if we could reinstate that system, you know, we'll get the whole thing hammered down. But, of course, the army wouldn't have. There's no way that the religious radicals of the army are going to accept Cromwell as king. Um, so he he went on as protector, but he died in 1658. And who was supposed to take over? Well, they just went back to what they knew, which was the eldest son. But his eldest son had never been in the army. And although he was an intelligent and I think very well meaning young man with some good advisors, strong advisors, he just he couldn't he couldn't stand up to the army. And then he had to call call a parliament, then the Republicans got back into Parliament, then they challenged him. And the whole thing just imploded. Confrontation between the army and Parliament, then the army itself split. And, um, well, then the strongest man there was, <laughs> General Monk, who was up in Scotland, asserted his authority i think he's a this is a real moment of a you know trousers of time because when monk comes you know marching down with his army he could have absolutely put himself in charge it could have been a protectorate under under general monk or it could have been king george the first because i think at that moment he held all the cards but he doesn't do that does he no, he, he's quite a curious man. Some people think he wasn't all that brainy, but I think he's an extraordinarily able soldier and strategist because when he left Scotland, it was not at all clear what he wanted to achieve. And yet he kept the whole thing from imploding. He prevented any recurrence of civil war. He played his cards very slowly, one by one, said he was on the side of parliamentary rule, that he wasn't going to have all these crackpots and radicals upsetting the apple cart all over again. But by the time he got down to London, it's difficult to know exactly who was influencing him there, but I think he was just a very astute man who believed in law and order. And he's actually quoted as saying that obedience is my watchword. He thought that a soldier takes its orders from the head of state. And as far as he was concerned, the only head of state still around was parliament and they had to get the parliament back in. And as soon as there were free elections, they just got a parliament, which actually, I wouldn't say it represented all the people in England, but it certainly rep <laughs> represented a wider spread of opinion that, that, that had been in parliament for quite some time. And I think probably by then there's also a feeling that the only thing to do was to re-establish the bits of the constitution that they had had before. Because it was funny how government under Cromwell had slid towards a lot of the structures of monarchical government because they'd been involved over time and they and they worked. So 
there wasn't really um the problem had, it had not been entirely monarchical government it was the way in which it had been carried out and the failures of adaptation because the world was changing very quickly but a lot of it was really workable and they brought it back in again and i think the plain people of england just thought oh we've got to have christmas and maypoles you know we can't be doing with all this godliness and yeah no theaters and they didn't even proper have proper marriage feasts, you know. They were just oh, fed to the teeth with it. <laughs> so, look, if there's one thing we know about the, about the people of these great nations, is that yeah, the national pastime is binge drinking. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna take all the the all the celebrations and all of the excuses <laughs> for that away from the people, it's yeah. not gonna wash for long, is it? No, it no, 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 no one wants to do adulting. No one wants to adult at that point. <laughs> Amazing. So your book is it's not just focused on the drunk people of England, is it? It's it's all nations. I thought it was really important to cover all three nations because, um, you know, if you live in Ireland, you hear about Oliver Cromwell and what he did to their country a very great deal. But when you talk to people in England, it's the English civil wars and actually the Scots started the whole contest and they seem to not play a very leading role in the story. But I think of, of those of the three countries, I mean, Ireland the, is the one that was really radically altered because the change in land ownership was so extreme before the war 60 percent of the land of ireland was owned by catholics and afterwards it was 20 percent. so you know they've lost control of their country and they could no longer sit in parliament and they couldn't vote and there was enormous depopulation emigration dearth and famine actually in the country so um it's a very important formative moment for ireland because everything that's going to happen in the next century is going to rest on those decisions and they were taken in a really ad hoc kind of a way and often by people who hadn't kind of experienced of the country so I felt it was important to cover that as thoroughly as I could but to equally explain what was going on in Scotland which was treated in such a different way largely because of the religious difference and um, it's a tragic story for Ireland whereas for Scotland and England, it was a horrible experience, the Civil War, but a lot was developed out of it. For Ireland, really, it was just pure loss. Amazing. I mean, I'm, I've recently fallen down the rabbit hole of sort of following all the, the Scottish campaigns and, you know, Argyle and Montrose. I'm totally team. Oh. I'm team Montrose, obviously, King's champion. Um, and I find that so fascinating but and you're right we cannot ignore what happened in Ireland at this time Clarendon in his histories of the of the civil wars he he actually says that Ireland was in a happy situation before the wars everything was fine there until this all happened um which I'm sure many would dispute but there is um it's a it's hugely important it's important to the conflict it's important to to the history and uh, does get ignored so, guys, you need to pick up a copy of Jane's fantastic book, Puritan Rule Under Cromwell, is available now in all good bookshops. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Jane. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.